uh, this kind of artifacts. Uh, culture for me is the sum total of the social process or the social system or the social order. It means that you have to have some fundamental values that society considers to be very important uh, criteria for the way people should live and live together. And I see that every society that is cohesive, coherent, functional, has to have some fundamental values, values that determine how you organize yourself, what you seek, how you seek your values, the way you relate to other people, the way you carry yourself, the fundamental principles that guide your life. And I see these fundamental values in our own society, maybe focusing on three. And when I talk of goals or social values, uh, I may be referring to my own experience in my own research, uh, which has focused on the Dinka. Please, when I talk about Dinka cultural values, don't take it as chauvinism or tribalism. It's just an example, a model of the social order that um, we can see in every one of our societies, maybe a little differently, but I think by and large similar. Think of social process or social order as a process by which people, whether they are individuals or groups, are seeking certain objectives, certain goals. And these goals may be material, like power, wealth, uh, technical skills, or can be moral and spiritual, such as affection, love, respect, dignity. Every society has their process by which these fundamental values guide the way you carry yourself in trying to seek these objectives. And the social process of seeking objectives, whatever they are, material or others, are determined by these fundamental values. And these values then, this, in a sense, determine how individuals carry themselves and how roles are divided. There's a role for chiefs, role for elders, for youth, for women, and each one has certain specialized functions, which together complement to form a social order. So think of social order or, or uh, social system as fundamental values that determine how we carry ourselves, how we function in society, and then they determine how we divide our functions with different specialized functions for different groups. As I said, chiefs, elders, women, youth, together we complement one another to form a functioning society. Now, every society in its own isolated way sees itself as the best, as God's idea of what a human being should be and how society should function. This is an isolation. Okay, let me give you some of the values that I, from my own work among the Dinka, I consider fundamental. And please, um, as I say it again, don't take this as being chauvinistic, it's just a model. We think of immortality, of life after death. And in our society, yes, these days we have the concept of going to heaven, or if you have not done well, go to hell. In our society, immortality is determined also by what you leave behind. Not only your children, your family, but also your friends, and what you have done in life for which you are being honored. What we are doing today is a good example of that. Derek is being honored today because of what he did. Every one of us, when we come to go, when God calls us to go, we think of what we are leaving behind. And what we leave behind is not only the people we leave behind, your children, your family, your friends, but also what you've done, what you will be remembered for. Then another value, which is, I think, fundamental and overriding, is what among us we call, by the way, the first value that I talked about among the Dinka is called koidanum, 
Because the norm is to stand your head upright, which means even when you're dead, you stand up, you continue to be a participant, you continue to have a permanent identity and influence among the living. Then the second value is what the Dinka called uh, Chengabai. Chengabai is living together. How you live your life, how you relate to other people, what kind of principles guide you in your living together. This means communalism, working together, helping one another, having a sense of solidarity. Another value that I have discerned in my work among the Dinka is a concept called Ben. Ben, translated into English, means really dignity. Dignity, how you carry yourself, how you live your life, how you eat, how you walk, how you, all these aspects of what makes a person feel dignified. So dignity, is then connected with the values of living together, the way you relate to other people, and also the way you want to be remembered. All these values integrate to form a social system. Then these systems, as I said before, these overriding values condition the way you live your life, the way you divide your function amongst others. Now seen in isolation, the social order including the way people see themselves, carry themselves, and relate to others, is seen as though this is the ideal, the ideal of what God wants us to be. This is when you are in isolation. Now, when you begin to interact with others, coming from other communities, the question then becomes one of how you manage diversity. Do you see yourself as God's idea of what a human being should be? What about the others? Do you look on the others as, as lesser than you? That can become a source of conflict, if not carefully managed. When we had national dialogue, there were complaints from some communities that there are communities that approach others as though they are lesser in values and looking down upon them. That is a source of conflict. Every society takes itself as the ideal. So when you come together into diversity, you must realize, and you soon will realize, that others also have a self-esteem that looks on their system as the ideal. So when you want to live together with, in, with other communities, you then have to recognize that we come together with mutual, with a sense of respect for ourselves, but we must also respect others. We must realize that they too see themselves as God's ideal of what a human being should they too see their system as the ideal of what a social order should be. And therefore, once we realize that, then we have to recognize living together means give and take, means understanding what is common between us. Where are we different? How do we complement one another to enrich one another? And so I began when I was in Juba, realizing the diversities which were reflected in our national dialogue, I invited a few friends, people I knew, people who were concerned about culture, for us to understand what each of our 64 ethnic groups, what cultural values do we have? What values do we carry with ourselves as important, as guiding us in a, the way we relate to one another? Once we have understood each other's values, then we see what do we have in common? we see how do we complement one another. And we see how we reconcile our cultural values and begin to develop a culture we may call our national cultural identity. And to me, this is the process. Once we come to that understanding, then we develop a code, a national code of identity and values that will guide us in our life. Now, I want to relate this to changing society. Now, as I said before, in isolation, we see ourselves as God's ideas, and it becomes a stable system, a system which evolves maybe, but doesn't change radically. It's a system where generation after generation, some changes take place, but there's a sense of continuity, a sense of our cultural identity, fundamental values that we carry with us in change. But then, 
there are times when some radical changes take place, when society is shattered. And war is one of those cases. When war shatters society or some calamity changes society, then the order we have is, is threatened, is challenged, sometimes shattered. We have to reconfigure. For instance, in my work around the world, wherever I went, I found that the role of women had been very much affected. The role of men and women were changing. Women were no longer isolated as, as housekeepers, as mothers to take care of children. They became also involved in activities of helping. Uh, so in some cases, they became the breadwinners. Men sometimes get disoriented. They go to war. They become disoriented because of the changes. Women rise to the challenge. So we have to then sit back and see how we configure the complementarities of traditional order. And in a sense, roles continue to be complementary, but maybe reconfigured. I then want to go to how cultural values are relevant to development, which is one of the elements of what I was asked to think about. And here I want to give you an example of what I found in Rwanda. I first went to Rwanda in the 70s and then in the 80s. And then about three months after the uh, genocide, it was a shocking experience. It was shocking. Literally, when I wanted to go to the churchyard, to go to the church, my helicopter landed some distance away. I was then special representative on, uh, on internal, on uh, genocide prevention. But at that time, actually, I was still dealing with internal displacement. Now, I hope I'm being heard because my screen has shattered, things have closed down. In the city of Kigali itself, and all over the country, you wouldn't see litter. You couldn't see any dirt anywhere. Utterly clean. And you could see a country that had been transformed from tragedy to a country you could be so proud of. One of the best in Africa, you could say. I asked one of the leaders who were uh, escorting me, a national figure, young man, but a leading character, how did you make it? And the explanation he gave me resonated so well with me. Uh, he said, you know, we built on our cultural values on our heritage, on our legacy, our values, the leaders, going back to some of the national figures, the kings, the, the nobilities, the loyalties, the people who shape their legacy, who shape their national figure, national identity. Then they also talked about cultural values of togetherness, working together, solidarity. And that solidarity they used in helping one another in building their houses, in cultivating their fields, a sense of togetherness. Then they talk about dignity, concepts that are very similar to what I had studied among the Dinka. Concept of dignity, the way, the, the idea was that you cannot be dignified if you're not clean. And you cannot be dignified if your house is not clean. And you cannot be dignified if your surroundings are not clean. Therefore, they embark on making people attend to cleanliness. Cleanliness of the body, cleanliness of the house, cleanliness of your surroundings. And on weekends, they said even the president would join the community in going around to make sure that the city was clean, to make sure that you had your gardens around your house well kept. Transformation that I couldn't believe all building on their culture, their fundamental cultural values, cultural values that were derived from their legacy to build a nation that people can be very proud of. And that relates to what I call transitional integration. Transitional integration is a way of knowing your fundamental cultural values and how you use them, your values, your institutions, your patterns of behavior, how do you use them in modernizing yourself, in developing yourself, seeing the process of development as help, as self-enhancement from within. So that development is not something you wait and see, it will be given to you by societies 
that have developed. And you look to others to empower you. You look to others to give you a sense of your value, your dignity and all that. No, it is within you. It is within your society. Make your society understand what your fundamental values are. Building on these things that I said, what do you want to leave behind as an achievement? How do you relate to your fellow human beings? How do you work together in solidarity to help one another? How do you build your society together? Now, when the world sees you doing that, they will recognize you, they will respect you, they will want to join you in helping you do what in fact you are already doing for yourself. That is what I learned from Rwanda. Rwanda began to build itself from within. That was seen by the world with admiration. Yes, there was some guilt about having allowed genocide to take place, so that in a way people were compensating Rwanda for having abandoned Rwanda. But it was more than that. It was also admiring what the Rwandese was doing, were doing for themselves. And so people became inspired to help Rwanda to continue to build what they themselves were doing to add to it. So I see therefore culture as a way of understanding your social process. Social process with has some fundamental values that we carry with us, whether we are conscious of it or they're inherent with us, wherever we go, we become conscious of who we are, the dignity we have as a people, our values, how those values influence the way we relate to others. And then you see when you get uh, to a different context of diverse cultures, you give and take, you learn. And within a national framework, we see how we share some fundamental values that we should build upon. If we differ, how do we differ? Can we complement one another? Can we enrich one another by borrowing from one another, giving and take? And then we move from there to the outside world. Again, I don't believe, and I'm talking almost personally, in my interaction with the world, starting from my local village, where we thought that we were the ideal, to moving to others, to discover that others whom we had thought were so different, were fellow South Sudanese, in some cases, we had even thought of some Dinka communities and, and non-Dinka communities as though they were cannibals, only to find that they're just like us, to find that they shared our values, that we're one people. And so when I move around the world, I feel I carry something with me, something that I call, to some extent, the invisible bridge. Let me say, in talking to South Sudanese communities around the world, wherever I go abroad, I say a human being is like a tree, a tree with deep roots. Even if the wind blows and hurricane blows, it will stand. A tree with shallow roots can be knocked down by even a light wind. And what is, what are our roots? What are our deep roots? The deep roots are our culture, our background, our legacy, what we carry with us that, more, that makes us feel the human beings we are, that gives us the dignity we have as human beings. So if you carry that with you, then in interacting with others, you don't just come as somebody who has nothing to offer. You come as someone who has principles of life, values that are inherent in you, that you may be conscious of, but even if you're not conscious of them, they're part of what formed you. So you then relate to others on those principles. I've had situations where I did things, people were surprised because they did not represent their cultural values. For instance, talking things out. If you have disagreements with somebody, you want to find out why, why is this? And, then, and when you begin to talk, you find some reason for why people behave the way they are. And it is what we say in our culture, grievances should not be held within you. Because you hold grievances within you, you should talk things out so that you find out where we differ. And I did things, even in my travels in Western world, where if I saw somebody treat me in a way that I considered unacceptable, 
I would approach them and talk it out. And he's a bigot. He's a racist. Don't. But I would say no. I want to find out what. And I have had instances where I did that. And so, as I did one of my books, And I consulted them called What is Not Said is What Divides. What is not said is what divides. But of course, what is said can also divide, can also cause conflict. So what is really involved is yes, say what needs to be said, but it's also a question not only of what you say, but how you say. And how you say it, it, it depends on the manner in which you treat others with respect. You must recognize that the other person too might have a point of view or might have some reason for behaving the way they behave. And in talking you then find out But they're never one sided, it's give and take. They have ended the time that was allotted to me. Let me say, therefore, that when we talk about culture, yes, song and dance are important. Uh, are, what do you might call fine arts are critically important. <laughs> of our way. <laughs> Uh, uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, I, would, uh, and, 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 and I would end by saying, and end by saying again, that this is a very important subject, one that we have to think about in a very broad, inclusive manner, and one in which, again, I carry what I call the invisible bridge, and that is wherever we go, we carry with us that internal order that cultural system uh, the invisible bridge means a link between where you start and where you go and that also means what you bring with you and so i just want to thank you again for giving me this opportunity and i hope that every one of us wherever we are should try to understand what are our fundamental cultural values that should guide us, not only in how we behave, but how we relate to others, and how we carry this. Wherever we go, I'm not just there, isolated from our background, but carry with us the things we consider important for human beings, the dignity of being a human being in society. With others. And I want to end here. I hope I have not come across as lecturing too much, but I would welcome any comments or questions from you. Thank you. Uh, okay.